Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space from the Museum of Science. Today, we'll be talking about the night sky with museum educators. My name is Mike, and I'll be your moderator, which means I'll be watching the chat box throughout the program. So if you have any questions, predictions, or observations, feel free to share it so I can relay it to our educators. So at this point, I'll invite our educators to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Talia, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your presenter today talking about some things uh, out in space. And I can't do it alone. And joining me today from the planetarium offices in the Museum of Science is my co-star. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her. And today I'm going to be piloting you through uh, many different places in the solar system. Um, so you'll want to pin my video when we're looking at um, Worldwide Telescope. And Talia will also be showing some visuals today as well. Absolutely. And to get us started, uh, we are going to, as Katie said, use the program Worldwide Telescope to head out into space. And so what we are uh, looking at is the solar system. We're out on the edge of it, but to talk about, uh, if you've logged into this show over the last couple of weeks, you've heard Katie talking about um, some missions that she's been very fascinated by both past and present ongoing missions. So today I'm going to uh, pick up the ball and run with it a little bit. We're going to talk about some missions that are yet to come that are about to happen and that I'm really excited about. And to get started, we're going to go, um, we're going to move through them uh, earliest to latest and it happens to also be closest to farthest. So Katie, let's start cl as close to home as we're going to get today. Let's head to the planet Mars. So Mars is the next planet out from us. Uh, we, Earth is the third planet. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. We call it the red planet for a reason. It is our favorite planet to send spacecraft to because it is the easiest planet for us to get spacecraft to. Um, because Mars is farther from the sun than us, it's actually easier for us to get spacecraft to Mars than it would to say Venus. That sounds a little bit counterintuitive, even though because Venus is actually closer to Earth than Mars is, but actually it's easier to move out away from the sun um, in a direct line than it is to move in more towards the sun. If you're heading uh, for a, a site in closer to the sun, you actually have to take a very long spiraling path in. With Mars, you can go more or less straight there. And it only takes six to 10 months to get a spacecraft to Mars, and we can do it every two years. So every two years, there's a launch window where Earth and Mars are in the right positions relative to each other to launch a spacecraft to Mars. And one of those launch windows was open this summer. So I'm sort of, this one's a little bit of a stretch. This mission is technically already started because the spacecraft has launched. It's on its way, but it has not reached its destination yet. And you may have seen the coverage of its launch this summer. It was a pretty big deal. I'm talking about the Perseverance rover or the Mars 2020 mission. You can use either name. And this is going to be our latest rover to touch down on Mars. And uh, it is touching down in a place called Jezero Crater. And it's going there because it's a crater that we think was once a lake. We think Mars had a very wet past. It had a lot of liquid water on the surface. Of course, as you can see from this view, it does not today. Mars today is a very, very dry, cold place. But we think in the past it was warmer, it had liquid water on the surface, and in particular we think Jezero Crater, where Perseverance is going to land, uh, was the site of a lake. And that's interesting because of um, part of what uh, this rover's mission is going to be. So I'm going to share my screen just so you can get an idea of what this rover is going to look like. So this is an artist's concept of the uh, rover on the surface of Mars. It's a large rover. So our last rover that we sent to Mars, Curiosity, was also quite large. We're in the era of the big Mars rovers. Um, you know, previous Mars rovers were fairly small, 
these guys are pretty large and perseverance is building off of what we learned from curiosity. And um, like I said, it has already launched. So it's complete, it was completely built. Here is a picture of it actually being built at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Um, and before it got tucked into the uh, spacecraft, the rocket to go on its way, which it is now. It's about 60% of the way to Mars. It's gonna land on uh, February 18th. And one of the really, really cool things, one of the things I'm really excited about for this mission is a couple of the things it's going to do on Mars. So it's not just gonna do, you know, the same sorts of things we've done in the past with past Mars rovers, it's gonna do new things as well. And one of those is that it's actually setting things up for a very exciting future mission to Mars. Um, one thing we would absolutely love sort of the holy grail of Martian exploration, other than getting humans there, is to bring samples of Martian rock back to Earth where they can be extensively studied in a laboratory. Because it's one thing to study them remotely on Mars, we can learn so much more if we could just get these rocks back to Earth and get them into an Earth laboratory. But that's really hard. So getting something down onto the surface of Mars is already really, really, really hard. Um, as evidenced by the fact that to this day, the only one space agency has successfully carried out a mission on the surface of Mars, and that is NASA. Other space agencies have tried. Some of them have even gotten their spacecraft all the way to the surface, um, but the missions have not worked after landing, or sometimes they just crashed. So it's hard to, enough to get something onto the surface of Mars, let alone actually getting something back up off the surface of Mars and back to Earth. And this is a challenge that we are, of course, trying to overcome as we are thinking about how to get humans to and from Mars. But first, what we'd love to do is get rocks back. And one of the things this mission, Perseverance, is going to do is it's actually going to collect samples of Martian rock and leave them in these little tubes and these little tubes of rock are actually going to be later picked up and brought home by a different mission, um, a mission that is still sort of being thought about, the Mars Sample Return Mission. It's gonna be a cooperation between NASA and the European Space Agency, and it's going to actually go pick up these collection tubes that curiosity or perseverance is going to leave behind it. So one of the things perseverance is doing, which I think is so cool, is setting us up to be able to bring samples of Martian rock back to earth. And that's going to be a major game changer in learning about the history of this planet and the conditions that it exists in now, which will be huge if we do want to send humans there. Now, the other coolest thing, in my opinion, about this mission is that it's technically not going to Mars alone. It has a little buddy that it's bringing with it. This little guy, this little bug looking thing. This is Ingenuity. So Perseverance is carrying Ingenuity to Mars, tucked under its belly. Ingenuity is gonna be tucked under the belly of the rover. And you'll notice Ingenuity is a little helicopter. So um, we are going to try and fly a little helicopter on the surface of Mars. It's very, very light, which needs because Mars doesn't have that much atmosphere. It's got about 1% as much atmosphere as um, Earth does. And that means it's actually really hard for things to fly. So this is a very, 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 very light craft. It's got pretty big rotors for its weight. And um, it's gonna, like I said, travel to Mars, tucked up in Perseverance's belly. And then once Perseverance is safely on the surface, it's going to lower Ingenuity from its belly and then actually drive away from it, leaving Ingenuity on the surface. And once it's deployed like that, this is when the really fun part comes, Ingenuity is gonna fly. This will be the very first time we've flown an aircraft anywhere except the Earth. 
there's been all sorts of concepts for how we could use aircraft to explore other places in the solar system. This is going to be the first time we're going to get to do it when this little bug like helicopter ingenuity actually takes to the air over Mars. And I'm really, really excited about it. Also, um, I think they gave them those names on purpose, per Perseverance and Ingenuity, just so that they could nickname them Percy and Genie, because those are their nicknames, I think, amongst uh, the NASA staff, Percy and Genie. Now again, Perseverance is going to get to the red planet on, uh, in February, February 18th. And uh, sometime after that, it is going to Assuming that it lands safely, because again, landing on Mars is really hard. Uh, it's going to deploy that little uh, helicopter. So that is a mission that's technically all already underway. And it's going to be um, active on the surface of Mars starting in February. So that's pretty soon. For our next mission, we've got to go farther away and farther into the future. So Katie, let's go ahead and head out to the Jupiter system, but we're not going to Jupiter specifically. We're going to one of its moons. Let's head to Europa. So we're heading now a lot further out. Now Jupiter is the fifth planet out from the sun. It's about 500 million miles, give or take, from the Earth. Um, and it has a very extensive series of moons around it. Now, Jupiter itself is a fascinating world, for sure. And we do have a spacecraft going in orbit around it right now called Juno, studying it and using little tiny variations in its gravity to um, try and figure out what the inside of Jupiter looks like. But we have long been very fascinated by Jupiter's system of moons, particularly its four largest moons, of which Europa is one of them. And we call these the Galilean moons because Galileo was the first to observe them through a telescope. And Europa in particular has something kind of special about it. And it's something you may or may not know already. Um, as you're looking at it from this perspective, it doesn't look especially fascinating. It looks a little ugly from this perspective, honestly. It's all gray and it's cracked. It's got cracks all over the surface. And that has to do with the fact that the surface isn't water or isn't rock. The surface is ice. And that's where all those cracks come from. And the fun part is the part I just sort of gave away. It's what's under the ice, water, liquid water. We believe that Europa has more liquid water under its surface than Earth has on its surface. Now we get very, very excited at signs of liquid water because life as we know it needs liquid water to survive. It's one of the reasons we're so fascinated with learning about past Mars, right? Because we know that Mars had a lot of liquid water in the past. One of the things we'd love to know is could Mars and did Mars support life on its surface in the past when it was a warmer, wetter place? Well, we don't have to go to the past to find places other than Earth with liquid water. There's plenty of it under the surface of Europa right now. And so we'd really love to know more about it. And we're not the only ones. So it's not just NASA who's fascinated by this. Uh, the European Space Agency is equally fascinated by it and uh, by some of Jupiter's other moons. So there's actually a pair of missions getting ready to go. Um, one from the European Space Agency and one from NASA. The one that's going to launch first will be the one from the ESA, and it's called JUICE. J-U-I-C-E, JUICE. Now that is an acronym. It stands for the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. And Europa is a pretty big target of this mission to try and figure out what is going on with that icy crust, just what is going on under the crust. Um, and this is the same sort of thing that we are going to be following up with with the NASA mission, which is called the Europa Clipper. Europa Clipper, and I've got some fun pictures of that as well. There's our old pal 
Ingenuity. And here is Europa Clipper. So this is a mission from NASA and like JUICE, it's gonna examine the crust of Europa. It's gonna try and figure out there have been some evidence, some evidence that um, the ocean, the subsurface ocean may actually be being squirted out in plumes uh, through the crust, which would be a great if we wanted to study the ocean because otherwise it's under, you know, a thick, 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 thick crust. It's much harder to observe or learn about. But that's one of the things we're gonna try and see is if there are plumes coming out of the surface, um, really learn anything we can about that ocean. If we can figure out uh, how salty it is, for instance, whether or not it might have hydrothermal vents on its bottom, which would be great because those can be food sources for ecosystems. So we've got um, a, a lot of flybys planned. So this map on the left is every single flyby that is planned for the Europa Clipper to make over Europa over the course of its mission. And uh, on the right, what you're seeing is one of the instruments at work. So the spacecraft is going to have um, several instruments that it's going to be using to study Europa. One of them being outlined here is a dual frequency radar. Dual frequency because some frequencies are better at penetrating really, really deep into the crust and finding out information about the ocean that's really deep below the surface. But we also think, like I said, that there are cracks in the crust where the ocean gets up much closer to the surface and a higher frequency radar is better for that. Now, the exact launch date for this one is a little bit up in the air. The original JUICE, the European, European Space Agency mission is launching uh, in 2022 and Europa Clipper was scheduled to launch in 2024. But here's the tricky part. It was supposed to launch on a, an SLS rocket, Space Launch System. That is NASA's big heavy lift rocket that could shoot Europa Clipper out to Jupiter really fast uh, in a mere like, few years and uh, get it to Europa nice and quickly. Here's the thing. Uh, it's got to compete for those rockets with the Project Artemis, the moon landing program. And there may not be enough rockets. So it's possible that Europa Clipper's launch date is going to get pushed or it's going to get shifted to a different smaller rocket, which would then mean it would take a longer time for it to get to Jupiter. So the exact liftoff and exact um, Jupiter arrival dates for this mission are still uh, up in the air so to speak. So I can't give you exact uh, launch years for this one, unfortunately, at this point. Stay tuned, we'll find out more. Um, before I move on to another mission, Mike, have there been any questions along the way that I should answer or should we just move right on? We do have a question from Emily. Um, she asked, why is landing on Mars so difficult? And um, maybe I can think of an extension too. I know this mission to Europa is not supposed to land there, but if we tried to get spacecraft to land on the moons of Jupiter, would that be um, even harder than landing on Mars? Both excellent questions. And I'm actually really glad you asked them. So Mars is hard. I mean, landing anywhere is hard because gravity is unforgiving, but Mars makes it extra difficult because it kind of has that little bit of atmosphere which is too much atmosphere for us to say, ignore it. Like we don't have to worry about atmosphere when we land on the moon. Um, but it's not enough atmosphere that we can really use it to our advantage. Like for instance, when we have a spacecraft coming back to earth. <clears throat> so when we land a spacecraft on earth, you know, when we're bringing astronauts back from the space station, we actually use earth's atmosphere to slow the spacecraft down we plow into the atmosphere and this is why you get all this heat building up. If you've ever seen pictures of it, <clears throat> you get lots of heat building up on the front edge of the, the spacecraft. Uh, and that is from friction from the spacecraft hitting that atmosphere really fast and the atmosphere slowing it down. This is the same thing that causes um, asteroids to burn up in the atmosphere and give us shooting stars and meteors. It's things being forced to slow down really fast by Earth's atmosphere. 
And that's good because then the spacecraft is going slow enough that you can just send a parachute out and the parachute will let the spacecraft float to the ground and your astronauts are inside and they're hunky-dory. We can't do that on Mars. Mars has enough atmosphere that we can't ignore it. If we just ignored it, this, our spacecraft would burn up, but it's not enough that we can just deploy a parachute and float to the ground. It's just too thin. Our spacecraft would just plummet like a rock. So we have to come up with alternatives and that makes it really tricky. So for example, what uh, Perseverance is gonna do is it's going to first try to break as much as it can with the atmosphere. It is going to deploy a parachute to slow down just a little bit more and then it's gonna cut the parachute loose and actually uh, ride a rocket propelled platform to the ground. And that platform is then going to lower the rover from a crane. It's really complicated. And that's kind of, it's, there's a lot of steps that could go wrong. It worked when we did it with Curiosity. We'll hope it works for Perseverance, but that does make landing on Mars really complicated. Now, as for landing on Europa, it would be a lot easier because Europa doesn't have an atmosphere at all. And it's pretty small. It doesn't have a ton of gravity either. So landing on Europa would definitely be easier than landing on Mars. And the plan is, if Europa Clipper is a success, to follow it up at some point with a Europa lander. And uh, that is still to be determined, but we do hope someday to land something on Europa because we have not landed anything on a moon of Jupiter. But there is a moon out there other than our own that we have landed something on. And I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a perfect seg uh, into our last mission. Katie, it's time for us to move on, which means it's time for us to move to my favorite planet. The next one out, Saturn. I love Saturn. Um, and I also love its moons. So as Katie brings us into orbit around Saturn, which is of course uh, a really fabulous place all on its own. Those spectacular rings cannot be beaten. I want to talk a little bit about some of Saturn's moons. Saturn has more moons than any planet in the solar system currently. We currently know of 80 moons going in orbit around Saturn, but there's one in particular that really fascinates us, and that is Saturn's biggest moon, Titan. Titan is a monster of a moon. It's as big as Mercury. So it's the size of a small planet. And unlike every other moon in the solar system, Titan has a thick, dense atmosphere. It's actually denser than Earth's. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. And it's time to talk about Titan. So here it is, it looks like a fuzzy blob. That's because it's air, that's the atmosphere, it's so thick. But on the right here, you can see a picture taken from the surface because we did land a spacecraft on the surface of Titan um, during the Cassini mission. The Cassini mission carried a little tiny spacecraft on its back, the Huygens lander, and Huygens did land on Titan. And it sent us this picture and it's learned a whole lot on the way down. And we've learned a lot more about Titan since from data from Cassini. And Titan is home to all sorts of crazy cool stuff. It's got insane kinds of chemistry going on in its atmosphere. It has rivers and lakes on its surface of liquid methane. It rains on Titan. It rains methane. Titan is the only place in the solar system with a liquid cycle other than the Earth. So there is a lot going on on this little world. It's fascinating. And Huygens only lasted a couple of hours. And we want to know more. We want to go back. And we want to learn more. And we want to learn a lot. So. If you want to cover a lot of ground, the answer isn't to put a rover on the surface because rovers, as awesome as they are, take many, many years to cover relatively small distances. The answer is to fly. So we have designed this little guy, the Dragonfly. It is a dual quadcopter and it's going to fly around Titan um, when it gets there. And what's really exciting is that this means that Dragonfly over the course of its life should be able to cover over 100 miles 
Now that doesn't sound like a lot when you consider this is a mission that's supposed to last years, but let me put it this way. 100 miles is more ground than has been to date if you took the distance covered by every single Mars rover and combined it, it's still less than 100 miles. So Dragonfly is going to cover more ground in one mission than all Mars rovers put together up to this date. We're gonna know so much about Titan. And there is even an idea that Titan could be a kind of place that could support a kind of a weird life, maybe not life quite the way we see it on Earth, but Titan could be a good place to look if you wanted to find some sort of life out there. So that's maybe something that Dragonfly will help us figure out. It's definitely gonna help us get to know this uh, weird moon a lot better. And uh, this one you're gonna have to wait for though. It's launching in 2027 and it's not gonna get to Saturn and Titan until 2034. That's just how long it takes to get to Saturn. So uh, you gotta have to wait for that one, but it will be worth the wait, I promise. Now, I know I talked an awful lot today. Uh, Mike, I hope, is there time for one or two questions before we go, if there's any questions uh, remaining? We do have a question. Um, Sarah asks, why does Saturn have visible rings, but other planets do not? Why can't we see those rings? That is an excellent question. Because of course, Saturn has these really gorgeous, spectacular rings. And it's not the only one with rings. The other gas giants also have ring systems. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune also have rings. They're really thin and they're really faint and they're extremely hard to see. And they're basically sad and pathetic. Saturns are huge and spectacular because Saturns, first of all, are just bigger. And because of what they're made of, they're made of ice. We think Saturn tore a moon apart. Uh, an icy moon and the rings are the shredded up remnants of that moon. Uh, and because they're icy, they reflect light really well and it makes them really bright. And as for why they're bigger than the other rings, we think it's because they're really young, maybe only like a hundred million years old, which sounds like forever to a human, but in terms of solar system time, that's really recent. So these rings would be very, very young and they're made out of highly reflective material. It's possible that those sad pathetic rings around the other gas giants used to look like this. And we suspect that in a few hundred million years, Saturn's rings are probably going to sort of disintegrate <laughs> and be sad and pathetic themselves. So we're lucky that we live in a time in the solar system's history where we have these big, beautiful rings. That's it for questions, unless somebody wants to submit another one for Italian to answer quickly. I think we're probably out of time anyway. I talked a lot. <laughs> we all do. Well, let's thank Katie and Talia for showing us the solar system and some of those exciting missions that are coming up. Hi, uh, everybody. I'd like them to say goodbye. And um, again, the software that they were using was called Worldwide Telescope. You can download it for yourself online and I hope you can join us for other broadcasts in the future. Also check out all of our virtual offerings at mos.org slash mos at home. And if you're able to, you can support the museum as well so that we can continue bringing you these programs. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>